<laughs> Amen. So how great when one day we shall bow in humble adoration. So what a day, what a day we have. So it's, it's, it is uh, my privilege to introduce to you, Unity Family, Brother David McCracken, one of my favorite preachers. And um, I was exposed to him at Fruitland Baptist Bible Institute. I was there from 2003 to 2005, and um, just kind of, I didn't know what I was doing, didn't know anything, just knew the Lord called me in the ministry. And to be honest with you, I was there at Fruitland, I first heard expository preaching and heard the preaching of God's Word. He was one of my, it was, I was so excited to see his name on the chapel schedule when he was there. He always fed our souls. Um, but it, I can remember... Um, fall 2004, he preached a student revival. It was one night he preached from Isaiah 6 and I think in Proverbs about a vision of God. And you cannot have a vision from God if you do not have a vision of God. He made two statements in that sermon that have really set the trajectory for my ministry. And um, I, I just constantly go back to them. They echo in my mind. One of those is, at her worst, the church is still the bride of Christ. And no matter how messed up we are, messed up the church is, he still loves the church, and it's, only, it's God's only plan. Jesus died for the church. And so at her worst, she's still the bride of Christ. The second one, and this is something I have to continually remind myself, is that people are not obstacles to ministry. They are our ministry. And so whenever we see someone that's in our way, we think they're an obstacle for us to accomplishing something. They're, they're not an obstacle to ministry. They are, they're the ministry that God has given to us. So um, those are two things. That, that message over, I guess, 12 years ago is still sticking with me. Um, he's faithful to the scriptures. Uh, Pastor David loves the Lord. He's pastor at Grace Baptist Church just recently there. He served for 22 years at Bat Cave Baptist Church. And uh, right off Highway 64, going into Hendersonville, and um, he—I was surprised to hear that he left. To be real honest with you, and I'm sure he shared with me he was surprised as well. And he's starting a new work there in Gastonia. I think you're from Gastonia originally, aren't you? As well, so it is a joy. He loves the Lord, loves the Lord's church, and we're going to be blessed this week. So, brother David, you come share with us. Thank you so much, brother. This church, what a blessing it is to be with you. Uh, when I uh, accepted the call to go to the Grace Baptist Church <clears throat> back at the end of June, I told them I had a couple of meetings already scheduled and I felt like I needed to fulfill my promises. And uh, I believe God scheduled this meeting back in February or March of this year. And so I, I told them uh, uh, that even though I'd only going to be here a month, I'm going to have to be gone this week uh, to do what God had called me to do. And they were gracious to allow me to do that. I just want to simply share with you on this 9-11. Uh, I remember that day. You remember it. My phone began ringing and uh, I turned on the television. Uh, that first tower was on fire. And as I was watching it live, John Scott was speaking there on Fox. I saw that second plane hit. And I wanted to believe that it was a rerun of the video that they had. But when I saw that, man, I hit my knees and uh, I got angry. I mean, I got so angry. So angry. And even today, as I stand here 15 years later, I, there's a righteous anger in me. that just absolutely, um, if I'm not careful, I'll get in the flesh real quick. I'm just being honest. You think we'd learn. We've had prayer meetings and revivals. We've had special speakers and events. We've had wonderful singers that would come in. <laughs> Not much better than what we just heard. I'll just say that. Uh, but uh, God, uh, it's, it's just like His hand is off of us. And I know it's not. I know it's not. But Unity Baptist Church, God is wanting more than the church in America wants to just move, to stir us. The church is alive. God's church is not dead. Amen. She's surely alive. Amen. And yet so many places, so many people who profess to know Christ, who say that they read the Word, who say that they pray, they have this I could care less attitude that just really stirs me to the core. When God sent me to Grace Baptist Church back in April of this year to do a funeral of a man who said, all I want to do is live my life 
long enough to where you become my pastor. I was called. I was saved under uh, in the church where he was a member. I was called at the church where he was a member to preach, to pastor. Uh, but God did not allow him to live long enough, but his wife's there. And as I was doing his funeral in that church, probably 400 people at a funeral, God spoke to me and said, you're going to preach here. And I thought to myself, I'm preaching here now. I just It's like a battle in my heart against God. And then God just, about six weeks later, just broke my heart over my disobedience. You know, we can get comfortable. You stay 22 years in one church, pretty much. You, you know, everybody uh, equates you with the church. And there's a, a, a level of recognition. There's a level of authority that's earned, rightly so, that comes with that ministry. And, and everywhere I'd go, people say, hey, I know you. I can't say your last name. I tell people all the time. I told a lady at the door. I was in the fifth grade before I could say it. Uh, but uh, you, you're in that cave. And uh, that kind of was a conversation starter. But I found myself under conviction because I was preaching that people needed to be obedient. Here God's dealing with me for six weeks and I was trying to tell Him, no, I had my life planned out. I left the church 22 years and had a 10 deacons, the most healthy church in the state. I don't mind telling you, these men were full of God, filled with the Holy Spirit. I went to each one of them and told them what God was doing in me with tears running down my face. I said, He's moving me. At a time where we were having long-range vision plans and people buying into it. By that I mean just simply coming along and working and serving Bradley. And I, man, I was so excited. And God speaking to me about all the faithfulness and all the struggles and all the valleys, all the mountaintops. A two and a half million dollar building built 12 years ago. He gave the money for it. God did. And here I am saying no to Him. Until one morning at four o'clock, he woke me up. And he started showing me my conversion and my call and the things that he's done in my family and in the ministry. And he started running through my mind 22 years of ministry in a church that had 44 people in it when I went in 1994. And when I left, we had 230 people in worship. He started commending me. The Spirit of the Living God did for faithfulness. And at the end of that time, with tears running down my face, 5 o'clock in the morning, by this time, me and him has been together for an hour, from 4 o'clock to 5 in the morning, just me and him, I'm sitting at my kitchen table looking out a window over my kitchen sink, seeing a full moon in the back cave, North Carolina, in the beautiful Hickory Nut Gorge, looking east. And I'm starting to, oh, you know, that's right, God. And then all of a sudden, he said this to me, and you listen to me, because this, this is the introduction to my message. He said this to me. Would you leave that cave for me? And I said, I'd do anything for you. That's what I said. And here are six years, uh, six, six weeks of disobedience. And I say to him, I'll do anything for you. Listen to me. As I said that to him, looking out that window, my wife was standing in the kitchen door crying with a big smile on her face. And she said, We're moving. I said, We're moving. I went and preached, 98% call. Church in a mess. Pastor had a moral failure, not just once, but it was a habitual sin. Be careful if you think that, that wine, that bottle won't bite, it'll bite. A cavalier attitude toward alcohol consumption today might prove in the future to be sin. And in this man's case, it was. Never thought I have to follow somebody like that in a situation. I love him, I pray for him, I did know him. But boy, it sure wrecked a church. And God put me there. So I just want you to know I've come because I believe God sent me. And we're going to be in God's Word. I want you to look in Daniel chapter 9 this morning. I'm not going to get into the 77 of these weeks. <laughs> I'll leave that for another preacher another time. But I am going to look in verses 1 uh, through verse 19 this morning. I've got four truths to share with you. Let me just, if I might, say a few things to you. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject, understanding prayer. Understanding prayer. The importance
importance of the words of God in Scripture cannot be overstated, overemphasized. We know that. When one develops a spiritual understanding of the Word of God, one can then commune with God as never before. You know, it's one thing to hear Jesus speaking to His disciples. We read the Gospels and we see, and we've often said, I know I have, wouldn't it be wonderful if walk with Jesus side by side and just hear Him turn and say, Peter, or say David, or say Bradley, and then just speak right to you. And we read the Gospel accounts how He'd speak to His disciples one-on-one or to, to one or three or take Peter, James, and John there to pray and He said, you stay right here and pray with me while I go yonder. And He'd come back three times and they were asleep. He could not pray an hour. And we, we hear those things and we think, you know, it'd be wonderful. But you know what's more wonderful than to hear Jesus speak to His followers? It's to hear Jesus speak to His Father. John 17 is a text you can read it and you can see it. That's the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6 is the model prayer, but the Lord's Prayer is to be found in John 17 where He speaks to the Father. And you and I can listen in. We get a peek into His heart, a heart that knew the Father's heart. The Bible is filled with stories. Let me just read you three or four uh, places. Jude 20 speaks about understanding prayer. When Jude wrote, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, pray in the Holy Ghost. He's speaking of understanding prayer. Or over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 15, the Bible says, What is it then? I will pray with the Holy Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with with the understanding also. Understanding prayer. Ephesians 6 verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Holy Spirit. And watching with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17. Pray without ceasing. And finally James 4 3 where it says you ask and you receive not. Why? Because you ask amiss. You ask wrongly. You ask that you may consume that uh, upon your own lust. So we need to pray. And everybody talks about prayer. We have prayer conferences. When I get back this week, Friday night and Saturday in Gaston County, we're having a prayer conference. The Baptist State Convention has, is uh, sponsoring it. It's at Woodlong Baptist Church in Lowell, not too far from me. And the church that I'm pastoring, I'm calling them to a Friday night and a Saturday morning of a time of prayer before God that Grace Baptist Church might receive healing and forgiveness and uh, unity uh, in, in the spirit of the living God. We need it so, so desperately. You and I need to understand that we're called to pray. We know that, do we not? But we're called to pray with biblical understanding. If revival is going to come to the church in America today, it is only going to come through prayer. Listen to me. That's based upon the Word of God. Amen. This name it and claim it is not of God. You can't pray over this handkerchief, listen to me, and get anything from it. As a matter of fact, I don't care how much you pray, if I've used it before you pray over it, you might need to wash it. God's Word is absolutely foundational, as I'm going to show you in this message today, for you and I to pray rightly, to pray confidently. You and I need to understand in the life of Daniel, you turn back in chapter 1, you see this young man who was a man of prayer. He prayed scripturally. He knew what understanding prayer was about. He proves this in verses 1 through 3 of Daniel 9. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books, listen to me, the number of years... Whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God. What to do? To seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God. Today we will look at this prayer. 
And I pray that this prayer today will be a great encouragement to you and to me as well that we might be people who are involved in and exercise understanding prayer. Daniel lived faithful to God. And at the very time that Daniel was reading the Scripture, at the very time he was reading the Scripture, Daniel found out that the time of the Babylonian captivity of the children of Israel, that time of 70 years, was just about to come to an end. And that biblical understanding prompted him to pray, not write a book, not to go shout it on the hilltop there in Babylon, not to go ahead and schedule preaching tours for two or three years around that in the Babylon. No, he was moved to pray when the Spirit of God took the Word of God and pricked his heart and said, this captivity is just about to end. And now that's profound. This biblical knowledge moved him to pray as he never prayed before. Now we're not told exactly what portions of Scripture were available to Daniel, but we do know from the text that he was no doubt reading the prophet Jeremiah. Now I want you to look in, prof, uh, in Jeremiah's prophecy, chapter 24. If you'll just turn back there, let me read to you a few verses of Scripture. I'm going to start in verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Jeremiah 24, verse 5, Thus saith the Lord, Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge them that are carried away captive to Judah, whom I've of Judah, whom I've sent out of this place to the land of the Chaldeans for their good. So in other words, God's saying through the prophet Jeremiah, you're in captivity, but it's going to be for your own good and for my glory. For I'll set my eyes upon them for good and I'll bring them again to this land. I'll build them and not pull them down. I'll plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. And as the evil figs, which cannot be eaten, they're so evil. Surely thus saith the Lord, so I'll give Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and his princes, and the residue of Jerusalem that remain here in this land, and them that dwell in the land of Egypt, I'll deliver them to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth for their hurt. So you who are being captive, taken captive to, to Babylon, I'm allowing that for your good. But those that remain here, and they're just okay with the program here, I'm going to allow that to be so, and I'm going to bring enemies to their hurt. In other words, God is simply saying, it might not be a bad, time, bad thing to find yourself where I place you. Whether you think it's good for evil, if I placed you there, I'm going to work it all out for your good. Romans chapter 8. So that's what he's telling them. And he's saying to me, a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a curse in all places where I'll drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine, the pestilence among them till they be consumed from off the land that I gave unto them and to their fathers. He might have read that. Or over in chapter 25 of Jeremiah, there's two verses, verses 11 and 12. Let me just quickly, setting the context, what's it say? It says, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass, when 70 years are accomplished, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity, and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it perpetual desolations. One verse in Jeremiah 29. Let me just read that to you. Verse 10. What does it say? It says, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, listen, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. He might have even read or been reading the prayer of Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 8. He may have had a copy of the scripture and read this portion. Let me just read to you 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 47. Yet if they shall bethink themselves in that land where they were carried away captives and repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captive. And if they say, we have sinned, listen, and have done perversely, we have committed wickedness and return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive and prayed toward the land which you gave to their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen and the house which I've built for thy name. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven thy dwelling place and 
and maintain their cause. And forgive thy people that have sinned against thee and all their transgressions when they have transgressed against thee. And give them compassion before them who carried them captive that they may have compassion on them. For they be thy people and thine inheritance which thou brought forth out of Egypt from the midst of the furnace of iron. That's key. Even in this prophecy, even in this prayer of Solomon, he calls attention, listen to me, to a furnace of fire. Do you suppose when Daniel was praying this prayer over here in Daniel chapter 9, and he started looking back in Jeremiah's prophecy, he perhaps had a scroll, maybe he had a scroll from Solomon's prayer. Do you think it possible that Daniel, as he's praying that prayer, remember that time when he and those other three Hebrew children were thrown in that fire? Do you think that maybe he might have had a thought about that when he read that? Let's read it again. For they be thy people and thine inheritance, which thou broughtest forth out of Egypt. Listen. From the midst of the furnace of iron. Now listen to me. I know that they made bricks down. I know what went on in Egypt. But I'm just wondering if I were Daniel, if that might not have struck home. Verse 52. That thine eyes may be open to the supplication of your servant and unto the supplication of your people Israel to hearken unto them in all that they call for, un for unto thee. Daniel, reading the Word of God. That's what he said. In the first year of his reign, the reign of Darius, I, Daniel, verse 2 of Daniel 9, understood by books the number of the years. Listen to me. The regular and the right use of the Word of God was Daniel's secret to faithful living. That's profound, the first meeting we share together this week. Reading God's Word and praying in the Spirit stand or fall together. I'm grateful that you remember the things that I've forgotten. I said a couple of things 12 years by his own testimony, he remembered them. It's just proof that uh, though you and I are feeble and frail and forgetful... <laughs> God did promise that His Word will not return unto Him void, but will accomplish that word until I've sent it. And by your own pastor's testimony, a couple of things that I said those many years ago, He still remembers. But listen to me. You and I today need to remember this. Your prayer life will never ever exceed your Bible intake. You and I want to see revival come to Unity Baptist Church to this county. You and I want to see a revival come to North Carolina, to these United States of America. You and I would agree this day, 9-11, 2016, that 15 years ago, we thought that might have been used of God to bring the church back to God. We thought that it might be that next day. That happened on a Tuesday back then. September the 11th was on a Tuesday. As a pastor, I thought tomorrow night that sanctuary will be filled with people in this community asking God to help. Let me tell you something. Something my experience of Bat Cave was not too many more people came that Wednesday than Wednesday before. And I'm speaking of people who were members of the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now my phone rang off the hook. Facebook lit up, and I didn't even know what Facebook was at that time. My face was in this book. Not like it should have been, but it was in this book. I was thinking, dear God, let me have a word from you. I remember preaching about that tower that fell and those 18 people were killed. Do you think they were sinners above all the rest of the people? No. It's just in the sovereignty of God, life happens. You and I are not promised today. Say amen. amen. Better be ready. Those people that went to work that day, they had no idea they wouldn't come home, those 3,000 plus. Those firemen that went, those 349 first responders, they had no idea they wouldn't be home for supper. But life happens. What am I saying today? I'm saying this. If your prayer life's lacking, I can tell you why. People who don't read the Word of God don't pray much. And if they do pray much and don't read the Word of God, they don't get much. Because God honors His Word. 
Let me give you four truths right quick this morning about understanding prayer. In verses 1 through 3, I want you to understand that Daniel prayed with a serious concentration. He prayed with a serious concentration. I've read these verses to you. Now what I want to refer to in Daniel 9 verses 1 through 3 is the truth that spiritual disciplines are most effective when one desires to hear from God. I would rather hear God speak in the middle of the night, 4 o'clock in the morning as I shared with you, and call attention to my sin than to sit in a three-day conference and hear somebody talk about what God said. I am of the conviction in 2016, and I am a Southern Baptist, but I thank God that the Holy Spirit got a hold of me before the Southern Baptist Convention did because I believe God still speaks to people today. When I told you early that God woke me up at 4 o'clock and spoke to me, so you think audibly, no, it's much more louder than that. Way down deep in my heart, the Word of God started coming back to me. All the sermons that I preached and challenged my people to be faithful to God. I told them that God speaks to them and He speaks to them for a purpose and that purpose is that they might immediately obey them. But Lord, when He spoke to me about moving, it took six weeks for me to hear it. But He never quit speaking. Daniel prayed with a serious concentration. He desired to hear from God when he read the Word of God. And the Bible says he set his face unto the Lord God. He was reading the Word of God and he was prompted by the Spirit of God. He fixed his face upon the Word of God and the Holy Spirit rewarded his sincere desire. The 70 years of captivity was about to come to an end. Daniel seriously concentrated his life to God and he seriously concentrated on what he was reading. Did you know that Bible intake is the most important spiritual discipline of them all. Now, Donald Whitney was at Southern. I think he went to Mid-America for a while. He's a great author. I love him. He wrote a book called Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life and he named many. Prayer, stewardship, service. He just went on and on. But the number one discipline, and I am in full agreement with his uh, perspective, is Bible intake. And by that I mean this. Hearing the Word of God, reading the Word of God, studying the Word of God, memorizing the Word of God, and meditating upon the Word of God. That's all Bible intake. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So the most predominant way you and I in our Christian lives intake the Bible, take it in, is through the ear gate. If I were to say in this morning, Union Baptist Church, how many of you have heard the Word of God this week? Stand up and remain standing. So the entire place would stand up. Everybody in it. We've heard the Word of God somewhere, sometime this week. Well, how many of you this week, honest before God, not to be bragging before nobody, but how many of you have read the Word of God this week? And in all honesty, some of us would have to just simply sit down because we've been so busy. Life happens. We've just not taken it and read it for ourselves. We've listened to 106.9 the light or some other radio station. We've heard it, maybe a, a live stream video. And so I'd say, well, how many of you have studied the Word of God this week? I'm talking about looking at your Sunday school quarterly, seeing what the lesson was, uh, or whatever, and still a few more would sit down. Well, how many of you have memorized just a verse? And you see where I'm going. I'd finally get to the fifth one. Hearing, reading, studying, memorizing, and how many of you have taken a passage of Scripture this past week and meditated upon it? Well, you know what Donald Whitney says in that book, and I, it just struck me. Is it any wonder why we have a hard time, number six, applying it in our day-to-day -day life? Daniel prayed with a serious concentration, fixed upon, set his face upon the Word of God, and then he began to pray and set his face on God, who sits in the heavens. And he started praying. You recall earlier in the book, the very thing that Daniel was known for is the very thing the liars went after. When the king has the decree, 
Nobody should pray into any place except the king. And they went to him and they knew that every time, that appointed time during the day, three times a day, they was going to find Daniel uh, sitting there with the window open toward Jerusalem. He set his face toward Jerusalem to be praying. So they, they realized when they had the king sign the decree, that's what we're going to get him. And they got him. Brothers and sisters, there's something to be said about Bible intake. There's something to be learned in this text about Daniel's heart. Do you realize that when we're focused on the Scripture that God by the Spirit of God will allow heavenly things to happen here on the earth? These spiritual disciplines prompted Daniel's heart to get closer to God through praying. And let's be honest. How's our prayer life? The answer we give to that question will say much about our Bible intake. The Bible says that Daniel prayed and he fasted. To fast means to keep one's mind unencumbered, to remind ourselves that we don't even deserve even basic food from God. We deserve nothing from God because we're sinners. We've sinned against Him. He said he put on sackcloth as a reminder that, listen, even in his sin, he had the comfort and protection of clothing that God in His grace provided. But he also found out with that sackcloth that even a royal robe could not perfect, protect him against God's conviction through the Word and by the Spirit. He put ashes on himself, signified grief over his own personal and then the corporate sin of the people of God there in captivity in Babylon. All of what he did, fasted, put on sackcloth, put ashes on himself, were affirmations, if you will, expressions, outward affirmations, outward expressions of an inward sinfulness before a holy God. And all this took place through reading the Word of God. And then he prayed, I'm a sinner. Just like David did in Psalm 51. He was broken over that sin, Daniel was. He said, I was seeking God by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And all of a sudden, <laughs> what did he do? He starts confessing his sin. He prayed with a serious concentration and that led to a steadfast confidence. Daniel prayed with a steadfast confidence. Look in verse 4. And I prayed unto the Lord, listen, my God. He didn't say I prayed unto the Lord God. He said, and I, Daniel, prayed unto the Lord my God. And what did I pray? I made my confession. He didn't start out praying as Isaiah did in chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 and pronounce these woes on the children of Israel who are uh, living in sin, who are uh, with unclean hearts and unclean mouths. And he pronounces all these woes on them until he sees the king of kings high and lifted up in Isaiah 6. Then, Daniel, then Isaiah prayed what? Woe is me. It's amazing when you get a sight of God how, how everybody else's sin just compares. It's easy to talk about the sin of the world, church, and not talk about your sin or mine. But once we see the Lord high and lifted up, we get real. David did. He said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Daniel says, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Verse 4, not only praying with a serious concentration, but praying with a steadfast confidence. Do you see it? I love it. I made my confession and I said, O oh Lord, the great and dreadful God, listen to what he prays, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Do you see the steadfast confidence? Do you see why I say he prayed with a serious concentration and steadfast confidence. You find it in the word covenant. Daniel knew that his heart knew a little bit about the heart of God. He knew that God is a promise-keeping God. He knew that what God said, God would do. He knew that if God said there'd come a time in seven years, it'd be it, 70 years, and that's it. Daniel knew it's about over. A man with such faith in God and such hope in the Word of God, listen to me, is a man that will pray with such faith and hope when he does pray to God. Your prayers and my prayers need to be saturated in love for God and love for God's Word. I'll make a statement, Bradley, and I trust it will be one of those that 12 years from now others alongside of you will remember. And that statement is this, there will be no revival in the church of God in America until the people of God once again fall in love with the written Word of God. Amen. 
It's not emotions. And though I'm emotional, my faith is not based upon my emotions. But before God, my faith cannot sit unmoved. When the Word of God is preached, when the Word of God is sung, when the Word of God is taught, when the Word of God is prayed, I cannot sit, Cody, and just be okay. I need more. I've heard that before. Not me. God stirs me by the Spirit and the Word. And the Bible says He's seeking for such even today to worship Him in that manner. For the Word and the Spirit together will create in your heart and in mine a serious, concentrated effort and a steadfast covenant confidence in a covenant-keeping God. That's what Daniel's calling attention to. And because of that covenant, Daniel confesses his personal sin. He says, it's my confession. Then he exalts the only one who is worthy of such worship, the Lord Jesus. He then consecrates, dedicates himself, devotes himself to do the will of God as it's revealed through the Word of God. You know what Paul wrote to the church at Philippi in chapter 2, verses 12 and 13? Here's what Paul said. He said, For it is God which works in you, listen, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. It's not just a matter of doing it. God wants us to have a will to do it. Every parent in here understands it. You say to your child, whether it's a boy or a girl, listen, I'll, I'll bring my child up in it. Somebody said to me coming in, this is just a rabbit. <laughs> you kind of look like Bill Clinton. <laughs> Now, y'all kind of see it now, right? You'd freak out. I, I've got a daughter named Chelsea. and when she, She's 26 now, but when she was in the second grade, I went to get her. We had a funeral to go to. I was officiating, so I was dressed in a suit. I was walking down the hall, and I heard this teacher say, Now, let's move to the side. We're going to eat lunch. How are you, Mr. McCachron? And a little boy in my daughter's class, he said, He looks like the president <laughs> as I was walking by. I remember, listen, saying to Chelsea one time, Honey, would you take out the trash? And I walked into the kitchen, walked into the garage, and walked to the driveway. And I came back in maybe 15 minutes later, and my trash was still overflowing in the can. I thought, so I looked over at her, had her headphones on, listened to her iPod, and I said, she took them off. I said, I asked you earlier to take the trash out. Take the trash out. I will, Daddy. I will. Let me just finish right here. I said, take the trash out. Now, you notice the tone changed? <laughs> she noticed it too because I had a look then. And that look was, do it. And you know, she did it. She grabbed that trash. She tied it up. She walked outside. The screen slammed. She put it in the trash can. She came back in. The screen slammed. She sat down. And she put that iPod back. And I just looked at her. Do you know what she did? She did exactly what I asked her to do, didn't she? <laughs> but was I pleased with it? See, it's the Lord saying, I work in you both to will and to do of my good pleasure. If your heart's wrong, though you do it, listen, I'm not going to ple be pleased with it. So I got on to her a little bit. <laughs> Next time I ask you to do something, it is not simply a request. <laughs> It's a command. I'm the dad. You're the kid. You're going to listen. Can I just share with you that our Heavenly Father works the same way? If the motive's not right, you can do it and not get credit for it. But I can prove to you by the Word of God that even when you can't do it, if the motive's right, you may get credit for it. Do you remember what he said to David? You can't build this temple. Why? Because there's blood on your hands. But it's good that it was in your heart to do it. Do you know what I believe? I believe he got some credit for that in glory. Because even though he couldn't build it, Solomon had to. It was in David's heart to do it. Daniel prayed with a serious concentration to the Lord, but a steadfast confidence in the Lord... And he prayed a prayer. Do you realize today that John, in first epistle, said if we confess our sins that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Revival is a time for the church to pray with a serious concentration and a steadfast confidence in a God who said, I'll forgive you, but you must confess your sin. Number three, 
Daniel prayed with a sincere confession. Now in verses 5 four, uh, four, uh, through 14, he just starts praying about sin. We've sinned, verse 5. We've committed iniquity and have done wickedly. We've rebelled. Done, we've even departed from your precepts and your judgments. We've not hearkened unto your servants the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to even all the people of the land. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to thee, but unto us confusion of faces. In other words, we don't understand what's going on here. We're in a mess. Listen, let's just take it to 2016. The church in America is just dumbfounded. That's what's going on. You've got Adam and Steve wanting to go in, rest, uh, in restrooms with uh, uh, Elena and Eve. I, I mean, we're, we're debating things that, honest to goodness, did you ever think it'd come to this, Harold? Did you ever think that we'd go to such a depravity that's manifested to where we're allowing boys and girls to even just self-identify any day they choose to wake up and say, well, today I think I want to be Jane. Yesterday I was Charlie. We're confusion of faces. We don't even know which end is up. What's he saying? Righteousness belongs to thee, but us confusion of faces. To the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, all of Israel that are near and some that are far off through all the countries where you've driven them because of sin, because of their trespass, they've trespassed against you. O oh Lord, to us belongs confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we've sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, though we've rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yes, even even all Israel has transgressed your law, even by the parting that they might not obey your voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we've sinned against him. And he's confirmed his words. He's confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven hath not been done as hath been done upon Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Listen, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. We're speaking of understanding prayer. Daniel prayed with a serious concept concentration based upon a steadfast covenant, a, a confidence in the covenant of God. But he also prayed with a sincere confession of sin. All this has happened. We know we've sinned. We've sinned against you. We've sinned against your precepts, your judgments, against your servants, the prophets, against thy law, thy voice, thy truth. And he gave some detail about that sin. How the people of God had gotten to that place of knowing God, professing that they knew God, listen to the Word of God, knowing His Word, knowing that He's patient, that He's merciful. And then He says in verse 13, yet. I'll just encourage you in your Bibles, if you have a Bible, just circle that word yet. Made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and listen, understand thy truth. Can, you, can I say this to you? Where there's not repentance in the life of a Christian, where there's not re repentance in the life of a church, it is proof positive that there's no understanding of God. Amen. God does not play. I'm going to say something. I'm going to give you a few examples that proves this point. The point that Daniel is illustrating here is this. We know when we sin. We know when we sin that we sin against God. We know when we sin. We know when we sin. We sin against God. And we know what God says about that, that He's not going to always strive with men. You know what revival is, Bradley? It's me coming before a holy God by the Word of God and God showing me His holiness while at the same time showing me my sinfulness and just saying to me, I'm a covenant-keeping God. Get right. Come. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. And then I refuse to repent. I see it all the time. This is not my first revival. This is not my first rodeo, spiritually speaking. 
I know what it is to come into the faith, the, 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 the people of the faith, and, and, and just take the Word of God and just give it to them. I know what it is to preach righteousness raining down, that God might come down as in Isaiah 64 and just, just pour out His love among the people. I've seen it happen. But more often than not, listen to the preacher. I've seen people come before a holy God with the Word of God being poured out before them and just simply with hard hearts and stiff necks say, Listen to me. Unconfessed sin brings judgment. And a lot of preachers today don't want to preach it. Joel Osteen this morning doesn't preach what you're hearing. If you've bought the book, Your Best Life Now, I would say, burn it. Because I've read in this book that your best life cannot be lived now. It's going to come, Kelly. One day we're going to live the best life. You listen to me today. The big crowds, they don't hear it. Why? Because judgment is not a topic that draws big crowds. Rest easy, my brothers and sisters. The same God that's promised to lift you up must first break you down. The same God that's promised to fill you up by His Holy Spirit must first empty that vessel. And you and I must get real before a holy God about our sin. If we don't, what happens? Listen to me closely. That which God deals with you in the middle of the night, perhaps even in the middle of a Sunday morning worship service, that sin, that stumbling block of iniquity, that sin that so easily besets us, that very sin that God calls to your mind right now, it may not be robbing a bank, it might be robbing God. That sin where you think, those thoughts that all men think, you look at those sights that are tempting to the flesh. The world says it ain't that big a deal, but men today are being ruined by them. You listen to me. Years ago, 2014, I had a guy tell me, you know who's coming to the cove? I said, who? He said, Bob Coy. Founding pastor 30 years ago at Calvary Church down there in Florida. I had a lady in my church walk up to me and said, Pastor, I got free tickets. I work there. I volunteer there. And they said, I got two free tickets to somebody. I said, who is it? said, Bob Coy. And I said to her, Sister, did you not read that Bob Coy was terminated from the church there at Calvary? Not for one affair or two, but over the years, many affairs. He was a charismatic, flamboyant, well-known, sought after. And you got to know that God had to have been talking to him throughout those years. Had to have been calling his attention to the fact that I see what others don't see. Had to have heard God say, now's the time to repent, bring it out. But you know what he did? Here's what he did. He presumed upon a holy God and God made it public. Tulian Tavidjian, Billy Graham's grandson. Core Ridge. City Church, down in Florida. Big, big work, big work. Same thing. God brought it out. Not too far from us, the president of North Greenville College, North Greenville University, Jimmy Epting. God was speaking to the president of North Greenville several, several years. Had to have been speaking to him. His own son called attention and said, Dad, listen, this is wrong. And you know what he kept on doing? He kept on doing what he was doing. And when God was trying to tell him, you need to repent, you need to confess your sin, get right. Let's do this between me and you. But he refused. Do you know what God did? He allowed. I didn't say he caused. I didn't say he moved upon the boys, the man's son to do it. But Jimmy Epting's son took a video camera into a home where his father was entertaining a, a secretary. And he videoed it and put it on YouTube. What am I saying? I'm saying we're just scheduling special services. That revival can't come if we don't get right with the Holy God about our sinfulness. And I know it's a small church. I know it's a small fellowship. But let me say, there's only one church. You can have 5,000. You can have five. Jesus said, I'll be in the midst where two or three are gathered together in my name. I'm over the big numbers. God never was in it. Now, though he counts, I got news for you. The biggest churches that get the big press today, one day, God shines his light. 
and the religious are seen for just that. What Daniel prayed, he prayed a serious, concentrated prayer that was based on his steadfast confidence in the covenant, keeping God. And he also prayed a sincere confession of sin. Let me close. Number four. Daniel not only prayed with a serious concentration based on a steadfast confidence in a covenant-keeping God, he prayed, a, he prayed a sincere confession of his own sin. Listen to me this morning. I woke up at 4.45 over here at the Hampton Inn where you graciously are putting me up these nights and God put me on my knees and just, I had a time of prayer for you. I prayed for Harold. Harold befriended me on Facebook. A man that would befriend me on Facebook is a man that's already praying for me and for the God to have is working here. I prayed for him. I just met Eve. I never met her before, but I'm praying right now as I preach for her. What am I saying? I want God to do something in Kim who sung for us, who leads the music. I prayed for Bradley and Kelly, for these three boys and a girl, and even for that new calf that I saw their youngest, one of the youngest, lay his head on. I prayed for him. I believe God sent me here to pray for you and to preach to you, but I'm telling you this first service, this Lord's Day morning, this is for Unity Baptist. Do you really want revival? Then read the Word of God and then pray the Word of God. And the God who authored both the Word and the will to pray will meet you right at the point of your need. I've been at Grace Baptist Church six weeks. Week number two, a man said, can I have some time with you? He's 43. Got three precious children. I said, certainly. He said, you better pencil in four hours for me. I didn't bless my heart. Can I just say that? That did not bless my heart. So he called and he said, are you in? I didn't have four hours. I said, I'm here. And he said, I'm on my way. And ten minutes later, he sat in my office and began to cry. And he'd been to share with me things that I'll not repeat this Sunday morning that blew my mind. And when he got through about 45 minutes of that confession, I looked at him and here's my first question. Are you, do you think you're a Christian? He said, yeah, when I was 13 years old after Bible school, I, I asked Jesus to save me and I was baptized. I said, I didn't ask you that. Do you sitting here right now after telling me three years of your life, these most three years, do you believe you're a Christian? He said, yes. I said, I don't. And I don't. And then I began to talk with him. When I got through, he left there confusion of face. He didn't know which one of his mama's sons he was. But I knew one thing. He was not a born again Christian. That's four weeks ago, three weeks ago. This past Sunday morning to Grace Baptist Church, when I got through preaching, I heard a blood-curdling yell come out, and I looked over as I was giving the invitation, and this man stood up, his wife and his kids were sitting there, and she was bawling, his mama was behind him bawling. He screamed out to God and said, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, and he ran down. I just told everybody in there, I said, the rest of you sinners in here need to hear what he said. And they got down badly before God. They got down with him and 45 minutes later they left. Now, so I dismiss some of those folks. You can go eat your chicken. You just go on home. I understand. Some of you need to go to work. Go ahead. But he stayed for 45 minutes. Why? Because God told him, you ain't one of my children. But he wanted to be. And that day... <laughs> he done business with God and came back at 6 o'clock and the first thing he said, he said, I'm a child of God. I'm saved. His eyes were just about swollen shut. That ain't a preacher's story. That's the truth. His name's Tim Bo Black. His wife got a new husband. His children got a new daddy. His mama got a new son. Grace Baptist Church got a new member. What am I saying? Look there in verse 15 to 19. Daniel prayed with a specific concern. What was it? Well, let's read it. Here it is. And now, O Lord our God, this will be our prayer to leave. Thou hast brought your people forth out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand. Has gotten thee renowned, and at this day we've sinned and we've done wickedly. 
So, O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I beseech thee, let your anger and your fury be turned away from the city Jerusalem, thy holy mountain, because for our sins and the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem, thy people, are become a reproach to all that are about us. He's simply saying because of our sin, the people mock you because of us. They talk all kind of evil. They, they doubt you and they, 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 they shout accusation against you because of your children. Now therefore, O oh our God, hear the prayer of your servant and supplications and cause your face to shine upon your sanctuary that is desolate for the Lord's sake. O oh my God, incline thine ear. Hear, open thine eyes and behold this desolation and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousness but for your great mercy. We're not coming to you on the basis of what we see in ourselves. We come because what we see that you show us of yourself. You're a holy God. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hearken and do. Defer not for thine own sake, O oh my God. For thy city and thy people are called by thy name. What would happen if we just get right with God and pray like that as a church in America? What might happen today? I'll tell you what would happen. Look in verse 20. Here's what would happen. And while I was speaking and praying, now listen to what Daniel's saying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and while I was presenting my supplications before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, listen to me, whom I'd seen in the vision at the beginning, he began to cause to fly swiftly. He touched me about the time of the evening oblation, the ninth hour, about three or four o'clock. What did he do? And he informed me and he talked with me. He said, Oh, Daniel, I'm now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. You know what God did? God sent an angel to him to confirm in his heart. And at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I'm come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. God gave him a fresh vision about the Messiah to come. I'll not go into it, but boy, I'd love to. Listen to me, church. Heads bowed, eyes closed. When you pray with a serious concentration, based upon a steadfast confidence in the covenant-keeping God, when you pray with a sincere confession of your sin and the sin of the church and the sin of this nation, even America today, 2016, when you pray with a specific concern in mind, that being to turn away the wrath and the fury of God and that He might purify His people, when you pray like that, what will happen? God will come down. If you're here today and you know for a fact that you're a sinner with unconfessed sin in your life, there's a holy God available today and He's able to forgive you. It's 1218 on this Lord's Day, but it's God's time. Would you come? Would you say, God, forgive me, a sinner? Would you not be like the Pharisee beating on, talking about all you've done, I do this, I do that? No, just come and say, God, I'm a sinner and I'm in need of forgiveness. Your pastor will be here as we sing this hymn of invitation. Don't tarry. Let's make this first service of this revival meeting the best service where we get real with God. Would you stand to your feet? This altar is open.